Let us pray. Oh God, we ask that you give us grace sufficient. Grace sufficient enough for us to hear what you have for us this day. For we ask in the name of your Son and for his sake. Amen. Winston Churchill is one of my favorite historical figures. And he said one time, to improve is to change. To improve, to improve is to change. To be perfect is to change often. I didn't want things to change. Even as a child, I didn't want things to change. And I confessed to you s- several months ago that, you know, when I was a teenager, when you were teenagers, we wanted to change the world. You know, we, didn't, we weren't satisfied with things as they were. But as I've gotten older, I kind of resist change a little more now. And I wish Bill Gates would leave Microsoft Word alone. Because <laughs> right when I get used to it, he changes something. But as a 13-year-old, I didn't want to change. But the change made sense to my mother, who had grown weary of my father's alcoholism. It still made no sense to me, though. I had friends. I had school. I was in sports. I knew neighbors, and neighbors knew me. I knew the streets and where all the best toy stores were. I knew, I knew, I knew. But my mother carried an 18-month-old little boy and a 13-year-old boy and hugged him off the porch and into a car filled with stuff. And she headed us off for South Carolina. Mama, where are we going? Well, we're going to, our, to my mother's house, your grandmother's house. We're going to my father's house, your grandfather's house. But Mom, I don't want to go. I don't want to change, I said. I don't want to change. It was even a protest. I knew, I knew, I knew, and I was comfortable with what I knew. Everything out in front of me in a new city or a new town, a new state, was fearful, uncomfortable. And I'd rather not go there. There's a theory about United Methodist ministers. You can agree with this or not. Some believe we are a byproduct of diapers that weren't changed very often. So we go through life trying to change things. I guess that's karma in reverse. But I'm not so sure about that because I know about as many United Methodist ministers that don't like change. You know, we invest ourselves in the things, in the ways of doing things, and the ways of thinking, you know, and to change that makes us uncomfortable too. So I'm not so sure about that theory. And that's why you made us go to continuing education classes, because you don't want us to be stick stuck in the mud. You want us to learn something new along the journey. As the Greek philosopher Heracles once said, the only thing permanent is change. The only thing permanent is change. There are a few people on this planet, I am assured, that really celebrate change. Now, I would guess there are a few that on the lower social uh, and economic ladder would like to have some change. They'd like to move up that ladder. There may be some in the prison system that would like some change. But even there, if you're in that system long enough, you become institutionalized. And you don't want change. Some don't want to get out because they're comfortable where they are. Some people would rather just die than change. And that's sad. And that's where we come... That's where we uh, get in our text at that very point when the, the Hebrew people, God is turning them into the Israelites. 
And God goes into Egypt and finds those slaves there and sends Moses in to extract them out of that land. These slaves did not want to go to the land that God had promised because the land that God had promised would change everything for them. Now they had seen the plagues. Their children were spared death. Uh, They had seen the pillar of smoke in the daytime, the pillar of fire at night. They had crossed the sea to dry land, but yet they still resisted the change required to go into the promised land. They would rather go back to the way it was, three hots and a cot. Back there where the flesh pots were, making brick and mortar. But at least it was comfortable. At least it was familiar. I think maybe it's primordial to resist change. I mean, maybe it's stuck in our DNA. I don't know. You know, there was a fellow, uh, I'm told, that wanted to go to his 40th high school reunion. And uh, he saved up his, the money with his wife, and they bought plane tickets. They asked a friend to drive them to the airport, and uh, they were going to go for four days to be with friends uh, there at their high school. And, uh, and the friend said they got downright giddy the closer they got to the airport. And they get on the plane, they go, and they spend the four days, and they come back, and the friend goes to pick them up. And they're distraught. Their, faith is, their face uh, is sad. Um, uh, they, they were actual languishing, the experience. And the friend said, what happened? What happened to you? You were so excited about going back and seeing your f- uh, friends of 40 years. And the man said, um, it was sad. It was sad. They hadn't changed a bit. Except for their waist size. Except for their thinning hair. Except for their wrinkles. They had not changed a bit. Hmm. Now, I have to admit, when I compare Honey Boo Boo with Shirley Temple, I get a little disturbed and wonder how we got there. (laughs) And then you you kind of cross uh, the character Jim Anderson of Father Knows Best with, you know, um, what's his name, Al Bundy of Married with Children. And I wonder how we went from lost in space to totally lost at Myrtle Manor. You know, I don't understand those changes and how they took place. Uh, The lack of civility and the casualness we have towards vulgarity and crudeness are are changes I wish we had not gone through. Then again, how did we go from, in 30 years, to members, church members, Christians, missing church more than they attend? There was a time when we would not think about missing church on Sunday morning. Now it's okay okay. Once every other week, once a month, you know, once every 12 weeks, Christmas and Easter. Things change. We've changed. We are okay with some change. How many of you still drive the first car you ever purchased? It was okay to change that, wasn't it? How many of you have a house that you have not changed, you have not painted a room in your house since you lived in it? That change was okay. Hush. (laughs) See, we are okay with some changes. I have to tell you that 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 little uh, surgery you go through for gallbladder now where they just put three little holes in you and they take your gallbladder out, that is so much better than when they used to cut you in half. I like that change. How about you? Yeah, that's a great change. Now, there was a book back in, that was done in the 90s that was fascinating, and institutions and corporations used that book uh, to talk about themselves. And the book was, Who Moved My Cheese? Who Moved My Cheese? And it is a great little parable. And it's about um, uh, uh, Sniff and Scurry and him and Haw. Sniff and scurry are mice. 
And him and Haw are little people. And they're in a maze. And the maze is environment. And they're eating cheese. It's Station C. Cheese. Station C. And they eat their fill every day. They just love eating that cheese. It's good cheese. And uh, they just get really casual about that cheese. They get to the point where going to the cheese, they just carry their shoes around their neck. And then sometimes they don't even take their shoes with them. They just stay and sleep there beside the cheese and get up the next morning and eat some more cheese. They get real casual about that cheese. And eventually they say, you know, this is pretty nice cheese. We deserve this cheese. This is our cheese. But one day when they go in to eat, the cheese is gone. Who moved my cheese? Sniff and scurry, they just scatter about trying to find more cheese, and they disappear into the maze. But him and Hall have a harder time with that. They just stay right there where the cheese was, where the crumbs were, and they lick up the crumbs from where the block of cheese used to be. But they get hungrier and hungrier and hungrier. And finally, Hall decides he's going to go looking for more cheese, some new cheese. And him tries to stop him. You're going to go out and people are going to laugh at you trying to do this new thing, trying to find new cheese. What are you going to think when people say you're a fool? Come on back here and stay with me. So him does everything he can to keep Hall right there and not do anything new. But finally Hall breaks away and he starts looking for new cheese. And of course he goes in some wrong directions along the way, but eventually he gets to station in new, and there's new cheese. And he eats. Then he starts thinking, you know, I could really help out him. I need to go back and write directions on the wall so him can find his way. And he does that. And at the end of the parable, Haw starts hearing some noise, and he realizes him has read the directions and followed in the way, and he comes and eats cheese with him. Now, Haw learned some things, and he said, here are the six rules. Change happens, cheese gets moved. Anticipate, cha uh, anticipate change. Get ready for the cheese to move. Monitor change. Smell the cheese often so you know when it's getting old. Adapt to change quickly. The quicker you let go of the old cheese, the sooner you begin eating new cheese. Change. If the cheese doesn't move, you move the cheese. Enjoy change. Savor the adventures and enjoy the taste of new cheese. Now, I read that little parable in, a, in an administrative board meeting many years ago as a devotion. And uh, there was a, when I got through and I had a prayer, this little lady stood up, and she was in her late 70s, early 80s, and she said, my Lord preacher, my Lord preacher, that's us. That's us. She had made the connection between the church and that maze. That little parable started being shared in Sunday school classes. And then it went to different boards in the church or different committees in the church. And within six months, the church began to move. And within a year, that church was exploding because they were looking for new cheese. Now, I suppose the reverse of that is true. There was a study along the same time this book was written uh, with some apes. And uh, there were five apes put in a cage with a banana hanging from the ceiling and a ladder. And every time an ape climbed the ladder to touch and touched the banana, cold water was sprayed on all five apes. So, one goes up, spray, two goes up, spray, the third one goes up, sprayed, and finally, the fourth one, when, when, when uh, the fifth one, when the fourth one starts up the ladder, what does he do? He grabs the fourth one and keeps it from going up the ladder. 
He doesn't want to get sprayed. And they all finally realize the connection between the banana and getting sprayed. Now, here's the, here's the fascinating part. They took one ape out of the mix and put an ape into the, into the cage that had not been sprayed with water. And when he saw the banana, he goes, starts to go up the ladder. The other four grab him and pull him down. So they take another gorilla out who had been sprayed with water and put another one in who had not, and he gets pulled back. Till eventually all five apes who had never been sprayed with water, guess what they were doing? Pulling each other back off the ladder to keep someone from touching the banana. And none of them had been sprayed with water. Sort of sounds like a meeting in the church, doesn't it? Have you ever brought something new up in a, in a meeting? Have you ever got sprayed with cold water in that meeting? Mm-hmm. What's the, what's the uh, worst words of the church? We've never done it that way before. We have never done it that way before. Trying desperately to hold on to the cheese in the church. Who moved your cheese? Well, it wasn't yours to begin with. That's the bad part. We get to thinking it's our cheese. It's not our cheese. It's God's cheese. And God moves the cheese when God wants to move the cheese. And it's for us to respond to that move. And we just can't sit here and wait for cheese to come to us. God moves the cheese so we can go, so we can grow, so we can thrive, so we can get active. Christianity is not static. Christianity is dynamic. And I, 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 realized, some, uh, excuse me, I realized something the other day that I, in 36 years of pastoring and preaching, it never dawned on me. And I literally sat up in the bed and had to go downstairs and think through it. Jesus never wanted to start a new religion. Jesus tried to transform Judaism. He constantly talked to the leadership of Judaism, and they wouldn't bite. They wouldn't do it. They would not change. He warned them. He kept saying to them over and over again, about relationships with other people and about relationship with God, that God was not trying to just put an old patch, I mean, an old patch on a new garment. Or, or, God was making a whole new thing. He's trying to transform Judaism into a new thing. He's not just going to put new wine into an old skin. God's going to give a new skin with new wine. God's trying to transform Judaism. And Paul, when you, when you look at Paul, he goes out into the highways and byways to preach. Where does he go first? To the synagogues. He went to preach to the synagogues, to the Jews, first. And then they threw him out on his ear. And then he went to the Gentiles. And in 70 years, from the time Jesus was crucified, within 70 years, Christianity was a full Gentile faith. Because people refuse to be transformed. Christianity is, is birthed in transformation. The sinner is transformed. Right? And we can't become what God wants us to become by staying as we've always been. It doesn't, they don't go together. Christianity is transformation. It's a constant transformation. When Martin Luther uh, saw the, the Roman Catholic Church, Roman Catholicism had become very stagnant. And he tried to reform that. He never really meant to break away. He didn't mean to cause a schism and separate. But because there was resistance to change, the Protestant Church was birthed. When John Wesley came forward and, and Charles Wesley came forward in the Anglican church, 
John Wesley never wanted the Methodist church to begin separate from the Anglican church. Wesley wanted to transform, reform the Anglican church. The, the Anglican church had gotten very cold, very distant to people. Sort of like Judaism, first century Judaism. Uh, the poor and the hungry were ignored. So Wesley goes out into the highways and byways, into the mines, into the peat bogs, into the alleyways, and preaches and teaches. And for that, he gets barred from the church. He gets barred from the pulpit of the Anglican churches. So he preaches on his father's grave. When the Anglican church refused to send preachers to the colonies, what did he do? He sent lay ministers to the colonies to preach and to teach. They refused the transformation. Yes, the, uh, the most um, famous words of dying churches, we've never done it that way before, and we're more concerned about the cheese inside the church than the new cheese outside. We've grown comfortable. Um, yes, Christianity is a constant transformation. John Wesley called it sanctification. Once you experience the justifying grace, then sanctifying grace takes place. And your life from that moment on to the day you die is a constant transformation, a constant change, a constant perfection, if you will. You're may being made more perfect today than you were tomorrow, and tomorrow God's going to improve you even more than you are today. Yeah. The very questions we enter these doors this morning with calls us to embrace change. Have I, have you, become the person God wants you to be? Have you arrived? Have I become the person God would have me to be at this place, at this time. Do I have enough love in me? Do you have enough love in you to become a selfless servant? Have I forgiven enough? Have I been grace-filled enough? Am I spiritual enough? Can God count on me in the tough moments? Have I helped First United Methodist Church to be all it can be here on the Grand Strand? Are we making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world? Is our chief uh, highest aim really about making disciples? And what changes do we need to make to become a relevant church today where we are at this time? We come here this morning to this church to think about those questions. This mixed up, crazy, wonderful world is not yet done changing. God is not finished with it yet. Regardless of what we see going on in the world, God isn't finished with this place. And neither are we. God is not finished with us individually. God's not finished with us as a church. Time marches on. The cheese gets moved. First Church has been in ministry and mission here on the Grand Strand for almost 75 years now. And it's getting ready for the next 75 years. Isn't that wonderful? That ought to be exciting. But I'll say this. My prayer, my prayer, that no one who knows us now will ever come back a month from now, a year from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, and hand us that old, worn-down Southern compliment. Oh my, you haven't changed a bit. For what a slap in the face that would be for Christ spiritually filled people. Amen.